Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining yet another episode of the CSM Practice YouTube channel. And I'm super excited to share today. We're going to have a very special guest all the way from Australia. He has not only been in a customer success leadership role for a very long time, he's also an active member of the Customer Success Collective. He's been a part of a public company that went private. I'm super excited to share some of the things that he's done to elevate net retention. And he's going to tell you all about it. Stay tuned. We're going to hop right in. I'd like to present to you Akash Singh. Akash, thank you for joining us. Hey, Rit, I love this podcast. Thanks for having me. You're such a legend in the CS world. So you're the head of customer success for Asia Pacific and Japan for a software AG. Tell me a little bit about that journey. How many team members do you actually manage? How is it to work in Asia in a big company? I mean, it is exciting here. Software AG, we're a large high-tech company integration since the primary business unit for us. And we have multiple products. We have a mature customer base. We have been around for more than 50 years. So there are varied customers, strategic, high touch, and then there are small and medium segments as well. I manage the customer success team in the Asia Pacific and Japan region. My team is relatively small as compared to other teams in the global customer success world, but they are all senior customer success managers and they all come from pretty technical architecture roles and senior consultancy roles. So they're very seasoned. The goal is to drive adoption for these customers and improve their maturity on these platforms so we can drive our go-to-market goal. Yeah, it's not one of those stocks and it's CSM teams where we just took SaaS apps, but it's pretty technical product. So we need people with that experience. You've recently been recognized as the top 25 CS leaders for 2024 by the Customer Success Collective. You have 20 years of experience in high-tech companies, including Telstra, Adobe, Dynatrace. All of them are large organizations. I guess that's where your forte and your area of expertise. You've been in CS roles for 10 years, multiple CS functions, both in Australia and in the U.S currently leading the CS function for Japan and Asia in Australia and in the US. And in your spare time, you run meetups to build like-minded communities of CSMs as part of your involvement in the Customer Success Collective. You're a busy man. I love that thing. You know, I love running those meetups and getting the customer success managers connected with each other. I think I'm the Tinder of the customer success world. So tell me, like, how long have you been for AG Software? And before you took over the team, what were some of the challenges that you were noticing that you were looking to solve? So I've been with the company for almost four years now. We have a very mature customer base. The challenges are very unique. We've been around 50 years in the industry as a company, and there are compliance challenges in the industry which we are dealing with, privacy issues. Whilst customers use our products, they are opting out to disclose any information to us. So there are no visibility for how our customers are using our product. We have multiple products, like I was saying, integrations being the main, but there are business transformation, there is IoT, there is API. There is a lot of use cases and there are a lot of designs. They have different ways they work and they have multiple deployment options too. Like they are on premise, they are in the cloud, they're self posted in the cloud, they have individual installations as well. It becomes difficult to drive adoption with this level of complexity. We have a lot of data coming in from the cloud, on premise, self posted installations, and data isn't telling us much. It's great, we can see those graphs, but it doesn't tell us where the customer is using our product and why is data changing. We weren't able to clearly measure adoption and see where the customer needs our help or where's the next opportunity so we can offer them something better or something more to improve their return on investment. And leading to this, I guess, and quite related to this, because we were missing out on opportunities, we couldn't catch our risks early, we couldn't identify opportunities where we could help our customers improve their return on investment or maturity. So I guess... All of this kind of boils down to your go-to-market goals because we were kind of 
not there, we needed to automatically identify our risks, catch them early, mitigate, work as a go-to-market team together. And we found that we were lacking that alignment between the customer success team and the go-to-market team as well. The culture wasn't aligned whilst the teams were capable when they were working in silos. So we had redundancy, we had uh, mixed messages, we were not able to catch or flag risks. And this was all affecting our churn rights, renewal rights, our expansion rights, and how we serve our customers proactively better. Sounds like a challenging environment. And I bet there's a few people listening to this conversation and they're like, yep, that's my world. I wonder what did this guy do? You did resolve most of it eventually. Yeah. Sounds like you took data you already had. You had usage data before when all these challenges were still happening. Nobody made sense of the data. It wasn't regurgitated into an index or a score or visible visuals or even alerts like call to action so that we get actionable insights. And that's what opened up for you when you took all that information, all this data, all this telemetry and pushed it through Gainsight. And then it sounds like they have some sort of a feature or capability that's called capability adoption score that gave you insights around what are they using. And so it made the CSM smarter around what should they be offering next? What might be the challenges? You got better at identifying risks early because now the data was organized properly. And it sounds like you had a better connection with the go-to-market strategy team. Yeah, hundred percent. So we were just utilizing all the tools we had, the CSM platform, trying to just make sense of leveraging all the players in the go-to-market teams, trying to understand where can we help our customers better? You know, where are the opportunities so we can identify those risks? And therefore, it was super important to be able to look at data where they are using and why is the data changing? And that's why the telemetry data is super important. The pure usage of the customer doesn't tell us much because it's kind of missing that part of where are they using? And especially in our world where there are multiple tenants, there are multiple deployments, we need to see where they are using and struggling. And where is the next level of opportunity? Do we want to handhold them? Do we want to offer some services? And we were using, like I said, capability adoption scores. So CSM can actually talk to the customer and actually score it appropriate. If customer isn't using the product, we would just mark it as zero. We usually auto-populated it with a score of 50, but if they weren't using, they would mark it as zero and that would identify a shelfware, which is risk. But then if they're not using, but they plan to, we'll mark it as 25. And that's a great opportunity to bring in a demo, a training and take it to the next level, put it on a success plan. And if they are using, but not to the full extent, that's a great opportunity to bring a dev evangelist or sell some services to take it to the next level. And if they are using as they intended to, then we'll mark it as 100, which we all want. We'll love our customers to use our products to the full extent. So I guess capability scoring worked wonders for us because now we could clearly see where the customer is struggling. And this was great because capability adoption scores, it's like a survey form. You could actually send it into your customers, even if you're rolling out a digital journey, and you can still capture the information and still drive adoption. And this was not just useful for our CSM teams only. There were other teams which were capitalizing on this as well. You could identify beta testers for your event, for your product teams, or um, presenters for your marketing events. Like the other day, I remember marketing manager called me and they were running an API management industry event. And they wanted to know, can you suggest a few speakers for this event? And I just ran a report and found who were the customers who scored the highest on the capability API management. And I could recommend some names. So there were multiple users. And the best part was my favorite. Because we had multiple products, this was wonderful because now it was all apples to apples. And we could still roll out the same scoring for each of the products. And then we could still come up with one holistic score for a customer. And we could still see what the health is for that customer. 
and what needs to be done. So I think this was working useful for us. Telemetry data was, was great as well because we could clearly see there are three tenants where the data is flowing to an integration server. And basically there are API calls, files, docs, messages. The light blue is the test tenant where our users log in and they write code. The pink is the test tenant and the light blue is the production. The users don't log in and do tests in production. Production is where they get value. And if you were just looking at the pure data usage, you would see the development coming down month by month on a regular basis and it's tapering down and there would be adoption risks, renewal risks, alarm bells. This customer is at risk. But if you just zoom out a bit and you look at the holistic picture, the complete picture of all the three tenants, dev, test, and fraud, this is a beautiful trend because a rise in dev would indicate that the customers are using the product more. Perhaps there's a new use case they're trying. And the rise in production is amazing because that means they're getting more return on investment, they're getting more value, and they're getting more sticky on the product. So that kind of improves our retention and we know what the customer needs next. In order to just tie this into the identifying opportunities and risks, we were also ensuring that we run our success plans for our customers and we had use case specific success plans. So we were running multiple success plans for a customer because they were licensed for different capabilities within the integration platform, be the B2B, MFT, and so on. And you see that CSM is running multiple success plans and keeping that customer engaged. And if I later on run a report on how this CSM is doing and how is this customer doing, as we all know, expansion is not sold, it is earned. If I marry this success plan data with the health scores, we could actually identify opportunities. And the data clearly shows that they needed help there and we started to help them there. And therefore, there were opportunities. And if I run a report on that screen on the right-hand side, you will see that there are opportunities about identifying overages, helping them with some services, I'm expanding their product usage to the next level, and so on and so forth. All these methods and tools helping us gain size capability, scoring mechanism, the transaction metering, looking at telemetry data, and just understanding where the customer is using the product, your internal processes to be able to identify risks and be escalating proactively, and also having the ability to be able to bring this all together and aligning your customer success culture with go-to-market teams was doing wonders for us, and we were working like a part and improving our GTM goals. It sounds like you had multiple initiatives to tackle these challenges you were talking about. So between capability adoption, leveraging telemetry data better, addressing risk mitigation strategies early on, so detecting risk early and having an appropriate action items and identifying opportunities for additional value. All of that sounds like that your top initiative here was to harness the power of all the telemetry you already had, put it into Gainsight and then gain some insights through that adoption index, as well as other capabilities to detect early risk and trends. First of all, how long did it take you before you took all this data, pushed it into this secret machine called Gainsight and got some outcomes out of it. How long did it take you before you started seeing impact on the business you mentioned? You reduced churn, et cetera. What kind of outcomes were you able to gain out of it in terms of NRR, et cetera, if you can share? We started utilizing Gainsight in 2018. 2018 was our customer success team founded within Software AG. And I joined a little bit later in 2020. So when I joined, Gainsight was already there and a lot of this was getting implemented. So I have seen return on investment on all of this pretty much straight away. As I joined and I was utilizing this for our customers and I had joined as a customer success manager before I started to leave the Australian team and the Asia Pacific and Japan team. So I could see that our customers were struggling and we couldn't see where they were struggling or that there were opportunities to help them better. And this sort of information was pretty good. It improved our time to market, time to value. I mean, I would say within six months, 
of me joining. I think I could clearly say that we were driving adoption. We had a clear view of what is going on and had started to hit our go-to-market goal and improving our renewal rate. So did you see a significant improvement in product adoption for some accounts? Because obviously the score is about product adoption. I mean, renewals and expansions are only the outcomes. Helping the customers use the product better and to be able to utilize the full capability and maturity. So we started to see that the customers were extending their capabilities within the solution. They were needing our help from our services team, from our extended customer architecture team, our solution consultants. They wanted to know what else is going on. They wanted to try more. They were having more POCs running. They had more projects running. There were more use cases they wanted to identify. And this is all which we as CSFs were tracking on our customer success success plans, where what is the adoption plan for this customer for the next six months to a year and beyond that. So I think to answer your question, yeah, the adoption was driven. When you increase adoption, you normally also add additional value. You partner with the client because you need to understand what should the next step be. And for that, you have to have valid conversations. You have all the data that the customer probably doesn't even have. And so you can share some insights. When you do all the right things, guess what? You probably had a better net retention rate, more upsells, and less churn. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, 100%. So I guess we clearly saw our retention rates getting higher because the customer was actually using the product. They were getting sticky. They wanted to use it more. And therefore, our churn rates were getting lower and our renewal rates are getting higher. And all of this was improving our net revenue retention. We promise to explain what the capability adoption scoring is. How did you structure it? And was the structure very specific to your product and business model? Initially, we started to use it as a visualization tool in our EBR just to show it to our customers what do they own versus rest of the capabilities? And then we thought about like, we can actually use this to drive adoption. So we devised this scoring scheme. We triggered an auto gain side rule, which had set a capability to a score of 50 if the customer was licensed for it. And that allowed the customer success manager to talk to the customer on how they are using it and then updating the notes for that capability. And post which, the CSM ranked and scored that capability accordingly. They scored it zero when the customer was not using it and does not plan to. And that identifies risk, that identifies shelfware. If they are licensed for it, haven't started using it, but plans to in future, the CSM would score it as 25, which is a great opportunity to offer them some training, some tutorial, a demo, you know, put it on the success plan and take it to the next level. Like zero, don't have it, don't want it, don't have any plans to use it. 50, they bought it, are not using it yet. And anything else, it's up for grabs. I guess the first time you scored, you must have seen a lot of grays and yellows. How soon was it before the average capability adoption scoring for your customer base went up and like... By how much, if I might ask, like percentage-wise? As the customer starts to use more, stay more, get sticky, they want to look into the next capability. You know? So you're right. It started with like gray, with 50 scores, then it became 25, 75, sometimes 100. This all went pretty quickly because we were engaging our strategic customers pretty intensely. We were running these success plans. We were monitoring this closely. We were offering them the next opportunity to move up probably three to six months. Yeah. And then the second challenge you said, well, product usage wasn't fully captured or truly measured. And then you said, well, we started using transaction telemetry. Maybe you can explain what that means for the newbies. What can you tell us about transaction metering? What is the big thing that opened up for you in here versus looking at it from a regular reporting solution or just having the usage data not measured? Just looking at usage data wasn't telling us where the customer is using and why is the data changing. So we thought it's not a true measure of adoption. So we wanted to look at telemetry data and we had 
the transaction metering data in our integration server, which we pushed into Gainsight, and we drew this. This is basically the integration calls flowing through our integration server. There could be the API calls, messages, docs, files. And this was useful in understanding adoption because we were sending data from all our tenants, from on-premise and SaaS tenants. These are all periodic counts of tenant names, server names, straight from our webmethods.io integration platform into Gainsight. And now this was insightful because we could see where the customer is using. So let me explain a bit. There are three tenants. You see three bars here, the three different tenants. The light blue is the dev tenant where we use a log sin and write quotes. The pink is the test and the dark blue is production. Yeah, if you were just looking at the usage data, you would be looking at the dev tenant and it is tapering down, it's coming down. There would be like adoption risk, renewal risk, and alarm bells that this customer is at full risk of churn. But in reality, if you just zoom out a bit and you look at this complete beautiful picture, this trend of dev, test, and prod, you will actually see that the customer is being more successful because a rise in dev shows that they're trying a new use case. They're using it. They're trying something new. Whereas a rise in production means that they're getting more value. The return on investment is increasing and they're getting more sticky. The best part of the transaction metering was Irith, that there was no contractual problem. There was no privacy problem. In fact, customers were calling us, which API ran for the longest period of time? Can you tell us the API which ran from point A to point B? And we didn't record that information for our customers' benefits, we didn't disclose that. It was pretty another cool. value that you can bring them now that you can get the usage data and translate to something meaningful. How brilliant. You also talked about one of the challenges does not being able to detect mm -hmm. risk early. And now obviously taking all this usage data, transactional telemetry data, there was more that opened up for you. Can you talk about how did you leverage the customer success system to catch and mitigate risks early. So we were again relying on Gainsight, utilizing it to be able to work out a process. We were trying to automate as much as possible. We were using the sponsored tracking feature within Gainsight. What that meant was that we were tracking all the contacts of the customer in Gainsight, all the key contacts. And if that customer would change their LinkedIn profile with a new title or a new job, and the CSM would get notified automatically. And then we can catch risks based on data rather than rumors. But here, we worked out an internal process where we were trying to track risks whilst working in a pod with the GTM team. So what you see here is a CSM is flagging a full churn risk. And she not only flags a risk and documents what the risk is about, but she also documents and recommends a mitigation strategy. And the beauty about CTA is the click to action says, if you see on the right, we can actually see in the timeline how the risk is tracking. You could say the CSM flags a risk, they escalated to get help from the extended team, be it an exec from the sales or the product team, they set up a meeting, they're trying to resolve things. And this way we were able to improve our customers' maturity because we could offer them help at the right time and we could resolve such risks. One of the best parts for me from risks perspective was that the CSMs updating the customer sentiment score with an update. And it is the gut feel of CSM about a customer's adoption health. And it is this sort of information that I shared with my renewal leadership for all contract 24 months in advance. See, making sure that we put a stop to that leaking bucket and we don't leave any store unturned locally or globally. One thing that I'm noticing between the lines here is that there's data that's automated and attributes and sentiment that's captured manually by the CSM and even activities that she's doing and her gut feeling but I can hear between the lines that this information is constantly being shared. You mentioned the go-to-market team, the executive team, renewals team. Who 
else did you make sure had access to this information and did they have access to it through Slack or did you actually give them permissions and licenses to Gainsight? So we are working on that. We're getting more and more teams into who can directly access Gainsight and see this information. But regardless, we, this information is with the CSM and it's being shared with the complete go-to-market team for that account in the pod calls. So that includes sales, pre-sales, CSM, the renewal team, everybody who is relevant, completely relevant, or helping the customer from adoption perspective, helping them improve their maturity and return on investment. You talk about renewals, you talk about collaborating on adoption and increasing adoption. What about expansion? Was having the data available now in an actionable, insightful manner, organized way better, having the ability to act on risks in a much more organized manner, does that also open up the other side of the house, so like expansion and upsell? Did you see more of those over time because of that access and because of that structure? Flat on, actually. Having the capability scoring data and success plans is magic, basically. Because now you could clearly see, marry that data up with the success plans and see where the customer needs help and what should we be doing. So what you see up here in this screen is you see multiple success plans, which we were heavily relying on because the customer was licensed for different capabilities for that integration platform product. So for example, there's a use case around B2B, another use case around MFT. Now these are different capabilities of our integration platform. And the CSM is running a different success plan for each of these capabilities. When you marry this up with those health scores, when you combine all of this together, that's when you are able to see where the customer needs help. So if I double click on one of these success plans, let's say the operational success plan on this screen here, on the left, you can see the CSM is strategically engaging the customer on different activities like EBRs, bringing as a services person, offering them help to a customer success architect, and so on. As expansion is not sold, it is earned. If we look on the right-hand side, I actually run a report on the CSM on how many expansion opportunities have there been, and I can see quite a few. There are opportunities where they are helping customers, and these are all quantified at customer success level. They are based on the success plan and those health scores. There are opportunities for overages. There are opportunities to take the product to the next level, to bring in some services. So this was great, Irit, because we could qualify this at customer success level. And the plan is to integrate this with our sales force. So this data goes into sales force and automatically creates some opportunity for our sales teams. I mean, this is brilliant. And I never considered to see a customer success manager running so many success plans with the same account. I could just assume this is a great way to think about that because it creates opportunities for quick wins. So instead of having something huge, like a big bang approach, you can actually agile all the different impact that you can have with the customer and show wins a lot faster versus if it is all one big project. It might take months before you, you know, comes to fruition. It could be very frustrating both internally to your CSMs, but also to the client. Yeah, hundred percent. Because these are all large contracts that run from three to five years, and these are long customer journeys. You're looking at more than a year worth of work before we start to see that expansion and all those things happening. But, but I'm glad that these tools and this kind of frameworks helping us help our customers better, improving that true delight, I would say, with our customers. I would say out of everything that has happened and transpired since you started with AS Software, what are the new capabilities that were introduced because of using the telemetry in the way that you did that you never expected potentially from early days where it was challenging. It's one thing to overcome challenges. What was most exciting as a new thing that you could do as a CSM? Now, as a CSM, you had some automation working for you. You had data available in the telemetry sense that you could see 
how and where the customer is using. So you could actually help the customer at the right time and at the right level. And you could also bring in the right people within the company to help. So we had the best people available to help the customer at the right time. And which was useful for us, like I said, it's all about providing that delight for the customer, that desired experience. Akash, you've been absolutely fantastic. If anybody wants to kind of turn the wheel a little bit in their organization, they have a frustrating situation and they want to turn it around and making being a CSM in their organization feeling like it's an empowering and an exciting role. What are some things that you would recommend that they do read, check out? First, watch Irit's podcast. I think they're very useful. I also enjoy just thinking creatively, and I would highly recommend that you have the data. I showed you the capability adoption scores. We never wanted to use it for driving adoption. That was just a tool for EBR, just to visualize things for a customer. Telemetry data was not even there to drive adoption. So just think creatively, what can you do? What can you use? What sort of data can you bring in? Can you predict your renewals maybe? Try and align better with your go-to-market teams. I actually quite like 16 Ventures. There are lots of great blogs and information about Lincoln Murphy. I'm a big fan of him. been following him for over 10 years. So check that out. Gainsight is my pro tool. If you have a tool to use, so definitely go for that. They have a, a CSM handbook. If you're starting up a career in CSM world, that's useful to read and learn from as well. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I think that anytime a guest comes in prepared, ready to rock and roll, gives us like killer examples to just inspire us all is what this podcast is all about. And you absolutely crushed it. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. You're, you're doing an amazing job in the CS world. Thank you so much. And with that, have a good day, everyone. I'll see you at the next episode.